The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin Chapter 15 The Division of Labor Political economy has always confined itself to stating facts occurring in society and justifying them in the interest of the dominant class. Therefore, it pronounces itself in favor of the division of labor and industry. Having found it profitable to capitalists, it has been set up as a principle. Look at the village smith, said Adam Smith, the father of modern political economy. If he has never been accustomed to making nails, he will only succeed by hard toil in forging two or three hundred a day, and even then they will be bad. But if this same smith has never made anything but nails, he will easily supply as many as 2,300 in the course of a day. And Smith hastened to the conclusion, quote, Divide labor, specialize, go on specializing. Let us have smiths who only know how to make heads or points of nails, and by this means we shall produce more. We shall grow rich. That a smith condemned to life to make the heads of nails would lose all interest in his work, that he would be entirely at the mercy of his employer with his limited handicraft, that he would be out of work four months out of twelve, and that his wages would fall very low down, when it would be easy to replace him with an apprentice, Smith did not think of all this when he exclaimed, quote, Long live the division of labor! This is the real gold mine that will enrich the nation. And all joined them in this cry. And later on, when a Sismondi or a J.B. Say began to understand that the division of labor, instead of enriching the whole nation, only enriches the rich, and that the worker, who is doomed for life to making the eighteenth part of a pin, grows stupid and sinks into poverty, what did the official economists propose? Nothing. They did not say to themselves that by a lifetime grind at one and the same mechanical toil, the worker would lose his intelligence and his spirit of invention, and that, on the contrary, a variety of occupations would result in considerably augmenting the productivity of a nation. But this is the very issue we have now to consider. If, however, learned economists were the only ones to preach the permanent and often hereditary division of labor, we might allow them to preach it as much as they pleased. But the ideas taught by doctors of science filter into men's minds and pervert them. And from repeatedly hearing the division of labor, profits, interest, credit, etc., spoken of as problems long since solved, all middle-class people, and workers too, end up arguing like economists. They venerate the same fetishes. Thus we see most socialists, even those who have not feared to point out the mistakes of economical science, justifying the division of labor. Talk to them about the organization of work during the revolution, and they answer that the division of labor must be maintained that if you sharpen pins before the revolution, you must go on sharpening them after. True, you will not have to work more than five hours a day, but you will have to sharpen pins all your life, while others will make designs for machines that will enable you to sharpen hundreds of millions of pins during your lifetime. And others again will be specialists in the higher branches of literature, science, and art, etc. You were born to sharpen pins, while Pasteur was born to invent the inoculation against anthrax, and the revolution will leave you both to your respective employments. Well, it is this horrible principle, so noxious to society, so brutalizing to the individual, source of so much harm, that we propose to discuss in its diverse manifestations. We know the consequences of the division of labor full well. It is evident that, first of all, we are divided into two classes. On the one hand, producers, 
who consume very little and are exempt from thinking because they only do physical work, and who work badly because their brains remain inactive. And on the other hand, the consumers, who, producing little or hardly anything, have the privilege of thinking for the others, and who think badly because the whole world of those who toil with their hands is unknown to them. Then we have the laborers of the soil, who know nothing of machinery, while those who work at machinery ignore everything about agriculture. The idea of modern industry is a child tending to a machine that he cannot and must not understand, and the foreman who finds him if his attention flags for a moment. The ideal of industrial agriculture is to do away with the agricultural labor altogether and to set a man who does odd jobs to tend a steam plow or a threshing machine. The division of labor means labeling and stamping men for life, some to splice ropes in factories, some to be foremen in a business, others to shove huge coal baskets in a particular part of a mine. But none of them have any idea of machinery as a whole, nor of business, nor of mines. And thereby they destroy the love of work and the capacity for invention that, at the beginning of modern industry, created the machinery on which we pride ourselves so much. What they have done for individuals, they have also wanted to do for nations. Humanity was to be divided into national workshops, having each its specialty. Russia, we were taught, was destined by nature to grow corn, England to spin cotton, Belgium to weave cloth, while Switzerland was to train nurses and governesses. Moreover, each separate city was to establish a specialty. Lyon was to weave silk, Auvergne to make lace, and Paris fancy articles. In this way, economists said, an immense field was open for production and consumption, and in this way an era of limitless wealth for mankind was at hand. However, these great hopes vanished as soon as the technical knowledge spread abroad. As long as England stood alone as a weaver of cotton and as a metal worker on a large scale, as long as only Paris made artistic fancy articles, etc., all went well. Economists could preach the so-called division of labor without being refuted. But a new current of thought introduced by and by all civilized nations to manufacture for themselves. They found it advantageous to produce what they formerly received from other countries or from their colonies, which in turn aimed at emancipating themselves from the mother country. Scientific discoveries universalized the methods of production, and henceforth it was useless to pay an exorbitant price abroad from what could easily be produced at home. And now we already see that this industrial revolution strikes a crushing blow at the theory of the division of labor, which for a long time was supposed to be so sound. You have reached the end of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin, Chapter 15, The Division of Labor. Click on the links at the end of this video to go to the playlist or the next chapter if it's available. If you enjoy this content and would like to support the channel, please like and subscribe.